Hello, hi, I'm Stephen Bryan uh, from the Center for Security Policy. And today I am introducing you to a new uh, book that we have published. It'll, it's available on Amazon. It will also be available in, in Kindle format soon. And it's called Stopping a Taiwan Invasion. Uh, it is a project uh, done by myself as chairman and my co-chairman, Lieutenant General Earl Hailston. And we had a great team of people work on this, and we came up with 34 findings and recommendations. But first of all, let me tell you something about the team itself, uh, because it's quite impressive. At the top of the list on the team is General Robert Brown. Uh, he was he was a commanding general of the U.S. Army in the Pacific. And then Admiral Scott Swift, who was the uh, 35th commander of the U.S. Pacific Fleet. Uh, next, we have Lieutenant General David Deptula. Uh, he's the forming, com former commander of the, of the George C. K uh, Kenney Warfighting Headquarters and vice commander of the Pacific Air Force. Then my good friend and colleague, uh, Lieutenant General Earl Halston from the United States Marine Corps, who was the former commander of the Third Marine Expeditionary Force and the Marine Corps base in Japan. The next we have Lewis, or Lieutenant General Lewis Reparata, who was also a Marine and former Commanding General of U.S. Marines in the Pacific. Uh, Seth Cropsey also joined us, and Seth uh, is formerly from the formerly from the Hudson Institute, but he is uh, also a, a, a former deputy. Assistant Secretary of Defense, uh, and a genuine expert in naval warfare and writer. He's written a number of books on sea power. Uh, Daniel Roper, Colonel Daniel Roper, is a retired U.S. Army uh, uh, officer who's now the Director for National Security at the United States uh, Army Institute of Land Warfare. And finally, uh, Colonel Grant Newsom, who's also a fellow here at the Center for Security Policy, but uh, he has been extremely active in his Marine, with his Marine hat, and after he had the Marine, uh, left the Marines as a civilian, uh, heading up a number of efforts uh, in Japan and in Taiwan. He's a real genuine expert in this field. And finally, Adam Savitt, who was uh, from the, also from the Center for Security Policy during the time we did this project, who served as the policy uh, program coordinator for China for the center. So we have a, a very impressive group. We've met for a period of uh, close to three months, uh, thrashing over and working over all the issues involving how can we defend Taiwan, should we defend Taiwan, and how do we stop a Taiwan invasion? Now, in the past, many war games and simulations and supposedly serious assessments, all have said that we would lose if we tried to defend Taiwan. And part of the malaise of these studies is that we weren't doing very well elsewhere in the world. We, we had problems in Afghanistan, which of course resulted finally in the rather tragic U.S. withdrawal. Uh, we now have uh, the war in Ukraine with the limited but serious involvement by NATO and particularly the U.S. And the current administration has been tilting away from allies and friends in the Middle East. And there's great concern whether the U.S. will respond in any way to China's military buildup. So these worries, let's call them worries, are influencing many people in the United States uh, and certainly in East Asia, where if you go to Korea or Japan or Taiwan, uh, you will hear a great deal of, of uh, nervousness and worry. Uh, now, Japan, it's an interesting case because in the past, Japan has not done a good job in terms of defense spending and has largely relied on the United States for defense. Now, part of that's because of the treaty that Japan uh, signed at the end of World War II, which rather demilitarized it and limited it to a home defense force. But all that is changing now, and I think the Japanese realize two things. First, that they must increase their defense budget significantly 
and I believe they will do so probably starting late this summer. And, and secondly, uh, that their security, in their view, is tied very much to what happens to Taiwan. So they regard Taiwan as central to their national security. And I think that's really important. I should also tell you that, that Taiwan sits very critically in the middle of what the Chinese call the first island chain. This is the chain that runs all the way down uh, from Korea all the way down to the South China Sea. It's the area that China wants to control. And, and what China is trying to do is leverage the United States, leverage Japan, leverage Korea, and all the other countries in the regions like Philippines and Indonesia and others uh, to essentially force the U.S. out as far as possible and to make deals and set up uh, military posts wherever they can. They've already done it in the South China Sea. Uh, most recently, they have announced a deal with the Solomon Islands, which is very concerning. Uh, and they will continue to put pressure on others like Vietnam and the Philippines and so on, uh, claim, making rather you know, strong claims to territories they really don't control and, and seeking to bolster their position and push the U.S. further and further back. So that's, that's the picture that we have, and that's what we wanted to look at. Uh, the result was that we came up with 34 findings and recommendations that if you take them together, and I think they have to be taken together, it's possible for the United States and its partners to establish real deterrence in the Pacific, and it's possible for the U.S. to help assure Taiwan's security. Now, all of these recommendations and findings require solid and proactive U.S. leadership. There's no way around that. And we have to take a whole of government approach to security in the Pacific region. That means that both the uh, NSC and the State Department and the DOD and the military services and the CIA and everybody else have to work together to help develop proper security plans and programs and implement them as soon as possible. Now, I want to give you two insights into some of the 34 findings and recommendations that we came up with. And these perhaps are, are two important ones, but neither of them requires any new equipment or material or expenditure, but it requires a very clear strategic political decision. The first is that we need to create, create a command structure, a common command structure that includes not only the United States, but Japan, Korea, and Taiwan especially Taiwan. Taiwan has, as you probably know, many people know, has been treated as a kind of pariah. It's not a country. We don't have diplomatic relations. U.S. officials in the past have not really allowed to go there. We do a little bit of actual training in Japan, but not nearly what's needed. But most of all, although Taiwan has built up a pretty good uh, domestic uh, security force made up of an army, a navy, marines, an air force. It's not in any way integrated with ours or with the Japanese or with the Koreans or anybody else. It's basically stand alone and stand apart and therefore far less effective than it could be if it was tied in with all the others. But even in regards to Japan and Korea, their forces aren't tied into ours. Recently, there have been some exercises uh, at sea and some air exercises and some on the ground exercises with the Marines, which are an improvement with Japanese and Korea, but not Taiwan, which are an improvement. But Taiwan should have been, of course, included in these exercises. But exercises are not the same as a common command structure. If for some bad reason, fighting would break out in the Pacific, the U.S. would be having great problems in working with its allies and friends, including Taiwan, because it has no way to coordinate with them. It has no way to deconflict uh, our aircraft and their aircraft, our ships and their ships, our artillery and their artillery, our missiles and their missiles. So it's really vital that we have a common command structure. And our experts panel believe that strongly. And I think the administration needs to understand that this is a vital step, something it needs to do, because it will build, immediately build, 
great confidence in the region that otherwise we will not have. Secondly, and this goes hand in hand with creating a common command structure, we need to replace the current policy of what's called strategic ambiguity. Now, I'm not clear what that's supposed to mean, but that's U.S. policy. It means, I guess, that the U.S. will not say we're defending Taiwan, not say we're not defending Taiwan, not say we're opposing Chinese exercise in military power, not say we're not opposing the Chinese exercise in military power. It's a ridiculous policy. It needs to go away. And it needs to be replaced with strong, positive, solid leadership from Washington. And it needs to be closely aligned with the intent of the Taiwan Relations Act. In 1979, the United States passed the Taiwan Relations Act. It provides that the U.S. will help Taiwan defend itself. And I think it's a clear commitment by the United States to Taiwan's security. And it was backed up even further by actual assurances given by our Secretary of State, which have been uh, supported down the years since they were made in the middle 1980s. So the basis for uh, strong U.S. support of Taiwan is there. Our view is that if the various recommendations we make, and many of them are quite specific and concrete, now you have to read the book to get them all, but the idea is that, that each of the U.S. military services each of the Japanese services, and the Korean and the Taiwanese, if working together, can provide real deterrence. And we go into a great deal of detail about the Air Force, about, and I should say Air Forces, about uh, naval forces, about ground forces, including the Army and the U.S. Marines, which have a very important role to play and which are uh, based in Okinawa and in uh, Japan. So that's the introduction to what I think is a, a very significant study and one that I, I hope will make a positive contribution to our national security, the security of our allies and friends, and especially to Taiwan. It will, if those recommendations and findings are implemented, it will raise the posture of the U.S. in the area. It will provide reassurance to our allies and friends and to Taiwan and it will let the Chinese know that we're serious and we're not going to walk away. We're not going to abandon our friends. We're not going to abandon the democracies which we have, which we have helped nourish in the region and which are of critical importance to the future of the region. So please check out Amazon. You can get the book there, Stopping a Taiwan Invasion. And we are here to answer any questions you may have about the book or about what I've said today. Just send us a note and we'll respond. Thank you very much.